Um, hello, everyone. We want to welcome you all back to the NSVP Innovate Seminar Series. Thank you for supporting our talk. Um, this forum is hosted by KITP, so special thanks to KITP. This is our monthly forum created by the NSVP Student Council, aimed at giving members a platform to share their research ideas and projects in a non-specialist way to a wide audience. This platform was also created so that members could engage with each other's research. We are very happy to have another installment of our series. And now I would like to introduce the president of the National Society of Black Physicists, Professor Stefan Alexander. Um, thank you, Farah, and thank you, KITP. Um, this, is a very, this is a very special, I mean, all of our Innovate Seminar series are special. This one is especially special to me um, because um, one of my mentors uh, who I actually met at the, my very first NSVP meeting um, almost 30 years ago, and anyway, we both had interest in hairdos back then, so I thought that he was a reggae musician, turned out to be a former president of NSVP. VP, um, Jim Gates, um, <laughs> um, met, you know, read many of his papers, um, even wrote a, a two with him. But anyway, um, even though I've known Jim for on the order of 30 years, there's somebody else here that knows him even longer. And, um, and we're going to now have um, former um, KITP director, Nobel laureate David Gross, um, and friend of NSVP, introduce um, our um, um, the president of the APS, Jim Gates. <clears throat> Thank, thanks a lot, Stefan. And uh, welcome, everybody, to this uh, Innovate Seminar Series uh, of the NSPP, which the KTP is very proud to help uh, host. Uh, and uh, this has been a marvelous series, and I congratulate you, Stefan, and everyone for doing this. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to, to be the one to introduce uh, Jim. I, I'm sure I do know him for more than 30 years. I think the first time we met, he reminded me of what I have no memory of. And the talk I gave at MIT has got to be certainly more than 30 years, probably of the order of 40 something years. Jim probably could correct me. In any case, I've known Jim for years and years, but mostly as a super physicist engaged in all aspects of supersymmetry theory, string theory, gravity, super, super, super. But more recently, uh, I got to know him very well. Uh, in a totally different context in the presidential line of the American Physical Society. And it's been an enormously great pleasure to, uh, to become very good friends and colleagues uh, and to appreciate, you know, not just Jim's obvious talents as a physicist, but his great talents as a, as a leader uh, in the public arena as a communicator of science, and today we'll see an example of that, I am sure. And as a you know, a passionate believer in science and its importance, and uh, he succeeded me, uh, I guess, a year, well, two years later, as president of the American Physical Society, which he is now, and he's done a magnificent job. It's really been uh, a great, very fortunate that Jim became president in this very difficult time uh, where we're faced with so many problems and he has provided truly magnificent leadership or continues to during this very difficult time. Uh, Jim has done a lot of stuff in various aspects of supersymmetry and supergravity and superstring theory. Um, recently, I gather he has developing uh, diagrammatic techniques to understand in more visual and simpler terms some of the basic representation theory of supersymmetric theories using, of all things, genomics. And uh, that's what he's going to talk about today, I think. And I, for one, am really very interested in this. You know, 
uh, it's really amazing how in certain areas of physics, visual and simple pictorial ways of representing complicated mathematical structures are so incredibly important. Think of Feynman diagrams, for example. And uh, I gather this is one of the main focuses of Jim's research in recent years about what she'll be talking today. And I'm sure it'll be, a, as always with Jim's talks, exciting and visually stimulating. So Jim, the floor is yours. I look forward to hearing from you. And uh, it's a delight to welcome you to the series. Thank you, David. And uh, thank you for those kind words. It was 1976 that we met. I was still in graduate school, and you came to give a talk, as I recall, on the dilute gas approximation of QCD. And so, uh, if my memory is serving me correctly, uh, it's uh, almost 50 years, <laughs> as I close to 30 years. Um, we certainly, uh, I think, our, our, the true uh, deepening of our relationship occurred in 2000 when we were both in South Africa. And of course, we had a chance to look at South African physics and it uh, got me actually involved in uh, some of their science policy, which I'm still engaged in to this day. And then of course, as you mentioned, uh, the last few years working uh, with uh, the uh, executive mind of the APS, I have benefited enormously from your mentoring. Uh, I uh, will never forget the, uh, the dinner when you stepped down and uh, we were all sitting at a table and you came over and put your arm around me sort of and said, it's sort of like, son, I've got to tell you some things. <laughs> and so I, you know, I really, really enjoyed that. And I tried to live up to the magnificent uh, accomplishments and standards that you and Phil, uh, and even before that, Roger, uh, set for the American Physical Society. So we've been through some rough times, but uh, I think we've weathered it pretty well. Okay. Uh, with that, I am going to begin my presentation. We did a check up just before we began. And, uh, my first slide is up. Okay, so I'm going to touch on genomics. That's certainly true, uh, but in the sense that it's a very light touch, and some of the some of the sort of motivations for what I do come from genomics. What we're really doing is uh, following a route that particle phys physics has followed for a long time but in a way that's new and we hope ultimately will be productive in pushing the boundaries on understanding supersymmetry. So um, this is the basis of uh, genomics. Uh, we know about uh, DNA structure, uh, the double helix. And of course, if you know the story of this discovery, you know that crystallography actually played an important role. Uh, it was uh, a, an English a female physicist by the name of Franklin, who was a crystallographer, who did the observational work that allowed Watson and Crick to uh, create this model of the double helix uh, based firmly on real data. Um, different kinds of graphs show up in uh, genomics these days. Uh, and in fact, genomics has kind of become part of, I like to think of it as info genomics because it's really about a lot of information and often this information is uh, packaged in graphs. So this is a, uh, a slide I, I got from my friend Richard Minsky uh, at an, an NAS meeting. And it basically is showing uh, uh, evolutionary uh, paths of variants of, excuse me, of um, cells that uh, metabolize glucose. Of course, once one starts looking for these structures, one begins to see them everywhere. Uh, the uh, Wikipedia editors uh, put this uh, graph up on the left, which was showing the contributions to the English language version of the Wikipedia from editors in other countries. And you can see all of them uh, circled around uh, the EN, which is for English version. On the right, we have a graph of sociology. And so one of the really interesting things, uh, which I only in the last decade have become increasingly impressed by is the power of graph theory. Now, for those of us in particle theories, we first learn about graphs with Feynman graphs, and we're gonna actually get to some of those. But graph theory is a, is a standalone area 
And we're going to be exploiting some of the things that come out of graph theory to try to push the boundaries and extend the supersymmetry. Uh, a very simple uh, kind of uh, realization of a graph turns out in, in uh, crystallography. This is simple salt where we see sodium and chloride uh, atoms uh, into their basic unit cell structure. <laughs> uh, here we have um, diamond with its uh, 18 uh, carbon atoms arranged in three tetrahedra within a cube. That's the basic cell of atoms. And these sorts of things lend themselves to drawing graphs. Now let me do one more, which is actually gonna be relevant for our later discussion. There's a class of elements called phagocytes. And their principal components are sodium and silicon, although they come in various variants. And um, in particular, uh, the, uh, there's an object called the truncated octahedron, which exists as the basic structure of these phagocyte compounds. And here you can see the silicon atoms illustrated in purple, the aluminum atoms are illustrated in green, and this object that, uh, they, are, uh, is that they define as a unit cell is the truncated octahedron. And we're going to meet that again. Now, one of, let me back up for a moment. One of the things that's really interesting about once one has this crystalline structure is if you are given just a segment of it, let's imagine, for example, that someone came along and found a, a piece of the segment of the crystal, which was only the silicon atom, uh, this aluminum atom, another silicon, and another aluminum arranged in this pattern. And then you might say, well, gee, what is the entire structure to which this segment belongs? And this is where I will touch on uh, genomics. Because in fact, this kind of philosophy is, the, is basic in genomic science, namely that you can take segments of DNA samples and the uh, NIH uh, in particular, and the national, here we're looking at the National Cancer uh, Biological Institute uh, front end. Uh, they have uh, online resources where if you can give a segment of a DNA strand and describe it at this, uh, at this uh, site, it will tell you the complete structure that is most likely that that, from which that segment is drawn. Now, this might not sound like, you know, too hot, but if you stop and think about forensic science, this is exactly what one needs. And in fact, this is part of the basis of using uh, strands of DNA uh, that are, uh, that are uh, acquired at potential scenes of crimes and then making the attempt to tie them back uh, to the individual because uh, often it is only a partial snippet of the DNA that one gets, not a complete snippet. So this is uh, amazing technology that has come about because we now understand the human genome uh, at such a level. And again, we'll come back and see an echo of this idea. So for uh, since this is supposed to be a fairly introductory talk. I, I'm not sure how familiar people are with the ideas of supersymmetry, so I'm going to next turn to that. Uh, first, we'll start with the standard model. <clears throat> this is my favorite rendition of the standard model, which I've developed over the years. Uh, later, we'll see why I'm particularly taken with this one, but the idea is that if we look at the fundamental particles in nature, there are one class of particles that we list in this first column, that obey the Pauli exclusion principle. And then there's a second class of particles that we have in the rightmost column, which do not obey the Pauli exclusion principle. Now, it turns out that the particles that do not obey the Pauli exclusion principle are all carriers of the forces. We have the eight gluons carrying the chromodynamic force, the photon carrying the electromagnetic force, the Z and W, the neutral Z particle and the charge W bosons carrying the weak force, and also the Higgs boson, which is also a carrier of the weak force, although it is distinguished from these other carriers by the fact that these carriers are all have an intrinsic spin of one, whereas the Higgs boson has no spin at all, so its intrinsic spin is zero. In the lower left-hand corner, we find all of the matter fields. So all of these fields obey the uh, Pauli exclusion principle, uh, but they are not the fundamental carriers of the forces. So here we see the electron, we split it into, one way it says we, we have split it into its chiral parts, its left and right-handed pieces. Here's the muon, the same split, uh, the tau particle. And we do this also for the quarks, the up, down, charm, strange, top, and bottom quarks split into left-handed components and right-handed components. 
These left-handed components you'll notice are doublets, where the right-handed components are singlets. And this begins to get at the group theory that sits behind the standard model. Uh, people often ask, uh, why do physicists, uh, physicists have such confidence in what we do, especially particle physics? And I like to, I've seen David actually give a version of this, although I've been doing it long before I saw it. I like to point out to people that the best known number in all of science comes from elementary particle physics. Uh, there is this number we call G. It measures the magnetic property of electrons. And it, uh, uh, 10 years ago or so, it was known to uh, the number of digits that we see here in the last two columns. The first being the measured value, the second being the theoretically calculated value using hundreds of Feynman diagrams. Uh, David mentioned Feynman diagrams, I did too. We'll come back to Feynman diagrams. And the variance between these two numbers, as you can see, is only in the last two digits. But of course, um, maybe a, a lot of you have heard supersymmetry is there because we haven't discovered it at the Large Hadron Collider. Well, some of us never expected it, expected to discover supersymmetry at the Large Hadron Collider. In 2006, in an article written and published in Physics Today, I wrote an article called Is String Theory Phenomenologically Viable? And in that article, I pointed out the following. From my perspective, I thought if nature was kind to provide, a, provide light super partners, one mil, still might expect about a century to pass before a super particle is directly observed. And I'll talk about direct versus indirect in a moment. Supersymmetry, I strongly believe, will uh, end uh, figuratively like being, uh, being like Mark Twain, who is often misquoted as having said, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. So those are my comments as far back as 2006, before the Large Hadron Collider was turned on. Uh, in 2008, I reemphasized those remarks. And in, in uh, 2010, after the first scientific run, and before the second scientific run had begun at the LHC, I was asked to weigh in again because uh, my 2006 prediction, if you want to call it that, turned out to be uh, accurate, uh, an accurate forecast of the future, whereas most of the people who study uh, particle physics in those days was, were expecting to find supersymmetry with great ease uh, when the Large Hadron Collider initiated its scientific run. So why was I so skeptical? Well, as uh, David mentioned, I, I'm, <laughs> I have followed the field of supersymmetry essentially from its birth. And due to that, I was well aware of how the phenomenological part of supersymmetry arose. It arose in 1984, essentially from uh, two pieces of work. There was one set of works that were done by Arnowit, Nath and Chamsuddin at Northeastern University in the U.S. And at CERN, uh, we had uh, a different group that uh, Nanopoulos uh, was one of the collaborators. And both of these groups concluded that the models of mathematical supersymmetry that people like me had been studying for almost a decade uh, could, be, for, could provide a basis um, for a phenomenological model. Now, this is mathematically correct because by using the theory of supergravity, you can show that it's possible to write down effective Lagrangians where the degeneracy between the super particles, let's go back and talk about that degeneracy. If supersymmetry were exact, one would expect that uh, at the mass of the electron, which is about half an MeV, which is a fermion, there should be something in this empty quadrant, which we might call a selectron, which would also have a mass of MEV. So exact realization of supersymmetry says that we're only looking at part of the story. So because I was aware how uh, this, uh, this uh, conventional wisdom came to existence, I was extraordinarily skeptical that nature would be so kind to us. And so with uh, my article, the second article in 2010, um, entitled Sticking with Susie, I pointed out that though the first scientific run did not find evidence of experimental supersymmetry, 
Uh, it wasn't my expectation that it would. And the question that was put to me was, did I think it would be found in the second run of the LHC? And once again, I maintain my skepticism. Uh, and uh, I, I've said this for a long time. Uh, anyone who thinks that what the LHC has done so far precludes the existence of supersymmetry, uh, in my opinion, is sorely uh, under a misbelief. In my view, the current situation is akin to that of an explorer who, having scoured the eastern seaboard of North America, includes, concludes that no groves of giant sequoias exist on the entire continent. As with this hypothetical hunt for giant sequoias, finding evidence for Susie depends on looking at the right place. And so far, what we've done is not look at the right, right place. Now, most people don't know this, but you see, I started my life as a theoretical physicist as a phenomenologist. About the time that I met David Cross, I was working on weak interaction phenomenology. So I know something about how phenomenology is done and what is the ethos and what is best practices. And all of this made me very, very leery of the great expectation that supersymmetry would be found at the LHC. In fact, within the last year, I had a conversation with my office mate, Mike Peskin, who was a major proponent for a why and for the uh, belief that supersymmetry would be discovered. Um, and uh, Michael and I discussed why we had different views. And it's a bit, but he still thinks there's an urgent question having to do with the Higgs boson mass that uh, if there's no supersymmetry, and this is a giant puzzle. So what is supersymmetry? Well, I've shown you the standard model. Here's supersymmetry, folks. You can see that balance that I told you about, that the electron should have a super partner. Well, here's its super partner to the electron. This particle is called the selectron. Uh, this is actually just the right-handed component, right chiral component. The left chiral component, again, we expect to be in a doublet with the super partner to the neutrino, the neutrinos. This is the electron neutrino and this electron particle. All the force carriers of the supersymmetric model have gained super partners. So the eight gluons over indicated by the uh, green uh, sphere with the letter G in the middle would have eight uh, gluinos. The photon would be accompanied by a photino, the Z particle by a zeno, and the W particles by a set of W, uh, w fermions. And in fact, um, the names of these objects are spelled W-I-N-O. Uh, and so, you know, I would be incredibly lucky to be alive when I would see a headline saying W-I-N-O spotted in Geneva because they would not be talking about an alcoholic specialist, but perhaps the mythical super part. Back to measurement. I talked about the electron's magnetic moment uh, a decade ago, but if you look at the latest data, data, data that's available from this, you can see we have progressed well beyond the set of digits, which I showed you in my last transformation. And so this is the reason we can be confident that quantum theory is an accurate description of nature. It's the best prediction scientist science has ever met. There's no other place in science where you can find a theory and an observation that agrees to this many digits. Uh, this agreement to multiple digits is starting to have some interesting implications about the possibility of finding supersymmetry. Um, last uh, spring, uh, there were announcements that an ano a long-standing anomaly with the, uh, with the muon's magnetic property, the so-called G minus two experiment, uh, seems as though uh, it's moving towards the direction of five standard deviations because that's the gold standard of particle physics applies to discovery. And so uh, this ability to measure to incredible accuracy uh, may be opening the door to do supersymmetry. And I have to tell you that part, part of my skepticism was also based on this ability to measure things like G minus two. Because when I wrote my first article in 2006, I was worried about the fact that if there are additional particles in uh, nature, I thought the first place you ought to look for them would be in precision experiments around quantities like the G minus two or branching ratios 
uh, or small numbers, not direct detection. And it turns out that quantum mechanics is involved here. A quantum mechanics can be thought of in, uh, in a simple low, uh, way as uh, Einstein, uh, Newton tells us that objects move along classical paths, whereas quantum mechanics says that no, probabilistic paths are the best that you can do as a scientist. And it turns out that Albert Einstein, whose image is sitting to the left here, uh, in fact, was one of the partial fathers of quantum theory. Most of the public doesn't seem to be aware that not Einstein's photoelectric effect experiment actually gave quantum mechanics a boost. The classical path in field theory corresponds to this Feynman diagram. Two, part, two electrons move along, they exchange their photon, and they repel each other due to that exchange. The quantum version of that is much more complicated. You can have two electrons moving along, one emits a, a photon and that it later absorbed, but in between that time, it sends a second photon to do the repulsion. That process is called vertex direction. And this process here, where a photon actually disappears, creating a positron electron pair, which later combines to create a second electron, is called vacuum polarization. And it's the hundreds of these diagrams that we can match against the observations of G minus two. So we got to do a little bit of history here. I'm going to rapidly try to get to it because I want to get to what the stuff, the stuff that I'm actually excited about. Uh, so back in the 60s, Bert Gelman and Yuval Neiman introduced something called the Eightfold Way. And it's based on, in certain mathematics, mathematically, it's based on the fact that there are eight matrices that I've written for you explicitly here, that when you calculate their commutator, they, have, they close as a set upon themselves. There's another condition called the Jacobi identity, it's satisfied. And these conditions come from mathematics as defining a Lie algebra. Um, those of us who deal with matrices know about the notion of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. An eigenvector is something that when a matrix acts on it, it only rescales the vector. We can find it by taking the determinant, the terms of basically a bunch of products. In this example, we can work out the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. And so this machinery can be applied to SU3. Uh, in SU3, we have three by three matrices. Uh, the eighth and third of those matrices can meet with each other. And so we can look at the eigenvalues for the third and the eighth of these matrices. They produce eigenvalues that you see here and eigenvectors that you see written here in the Ket notation of the right. Now, the thing that's really interesting about these eigenvalues is you can think of them as defining a space, a two-dimensional space, where the x-axis is the value along T3 and the y-axis is the value along T8. We can also create raising and lowering operators for the remaining generators, the ones that don't commute. And what you get from this leads to the ability to actually figure out all possible representations of SU3. Uh, the raising operators, T1 plus T2, uh, we will see will move us along the horizontal direction. T4 plus IT5 will move us at, uh, at um, 60 degrees with respect to that. And T6 and T7 will move from the origin to 120 degrees. And so you get the notion of a grid. And this is where we're going to be touching on polytopes again. For SU3, the shape of that grid I've drawn for you here. And here's a short, uh, a short segment of the grid. And particles like quarks, actually sit at the vertices of these grids. So we've seen the quarks, which I've drawn here, and the anti-quarks. Looking back at this, here's the quark representation, here's the anti-quark representation. And so once you know about these grids, you can start asking questions about, well, can I get other arrangements of quarks and anti-quarks? The answer is yes. And this is what Murray Gell-Mann brought forcefully to physics. This is the octet that contains the photon and the neutron together with the, a more esoteric set of particles called the hyperons, the lambda particle and the xi particles. Uh, there are also mesons that follow this pattern. So the pions, which is a very familiar particle for nuclear, for nuclear physics actually also is in an octet. But there is also this arrangement that the couplet and it's this arrangement that Murray Gelman used to really drive home the importance 
of understanding group theory because at a meeting in the late 60s at CERN where the discovery of these two particles had just been announced in the question and answer session, uh, Murray stood up and made the prediction of this particle. And because of these mass differences being approximately the same, and because he knew the group theory of this particle, he could predict couplings as well as approximately where the mass were, would be found. And that happened. And that's when particle physicists fell in love with a group theory and Lee algebras. There are more complicated patterns that you can write down. But can these polytopes, can something like polytopes undergird supersymmetric extensions of the standard model? Now, remember, I've told you that observationally and experimentally, we have not seen evidence for supersymmetry. So I'm now taking you purely into the world of mathematics, and we're going to assume that at some distant point in the future, supersymmetry is confirmed, and then ask ourselves, if that occurs, where are the polytopes that are like those that we saw in SU3? Well, before I do that, let me point out that uh, Abdus Salam and John Strathley back in 1972 gave a beautiful piece of mathematics that explains why supersymmetry uh, can be thought of as an extension of the idea of four space that Einstein's Minkowski space uh, uses for relativity. But in the extension that Salam and Strathley use, they introduce new coordinates, but these new coordinates are not numbers. They answer commute with themselves, and there are four of them. So if you do a Taylor series expansion of new coordinates, it stops at four if you're in four dimensions. Now, these coefficients that sit in this expansion are actually the kinds of fields that we find in the standard model. So this is the geometrical origin of supersymmetry. The fact that we can think of our world as not just having four bosonic coordinates, but also four spinorial coordinates that are not numbers that have a number of odd properties. But if you use this notion, you get led to those supersymmetric pairs that I showed you. Uh, in extending this to 11 dimension uh, in the um, middle 70s, Kramer and Julia discovered there's a mathematical theory called M theory. In that theory, there is one fermion, a gravitino, a particle that is the force carrier for gravity in this imaginal math and this imaginary mathematical world. And there are two bosons, the particle carrying gravity, the graviton, and another particle called the um, three form. And so if you actually look back at this table here, you'll notice there's something very interesting about it. If you look, if you count the weight of these blue symbols, you'll see it's one plus one plus one plus four plus one. That's a total of eight. If you count the weight of these eight signal, uh, uh, these red uh, boxes, you'll find it's four plus four is eight. And so there's an equality of, of something in supersymmetry. And if you go to count the number of fields here, that equality is not satisfied unless, there is no less, unless you apply the classical equations of motion to this system. Because if you do that, what you find out is that this thing constitutes 128 different helicities, and the sum of these things is 128, and you restore the equality. Now, notice I have to use the classical equations of motion to reach this. That means if I'm in a fully quantum realm, this theory does not satisfy this equality condition that supersymmetry sets out for it. So this, so when we talk about the vast majority of supersymmetrical theories, we're talking about them in this sense. We're talking about theories where there are fields, but those fields must be on shell, i.e. obey the classical equations of motion. So right after Krimer and Julia, um, well, maybe about five years after Krimer and Julia uh, first introduced this theory, I studied it in terms of supergeometry, uh, looking to ask the question, can we restore the balance somehow? Because in four dimensions, you can write a similar theory. In four dimensions, there's only a graviton and a gravitino. And if they're on shell, they balance exactly. But we also know how to balance the degrees of being off shell by introducing more field components. And so at that time, I began to wonder, why couldn't we do the same in 11 dimensions? Well, folks, it's almost 40 years later. And up until that, uh, up, some work I did starting in, 19, in uh, 2019 with two of my graduate students, no one had ever found a way to achieve that result of adding extra auxiliary fields, as they call, to achieve to restore the balance when the when the dynamical fields do not satisfy their classical equations of motion. So I wrote a series of papers 
And the thing about it is the way that we were able to find solutions to this problem was to totally dispense with the, the Salam Stockton viewpoint and instead to use the mathematics of graphs, networks, and the spirit of genomics. So we can now answer this question. The simplest superfield that contains uh, the physical graviton, well, the graviton in 11 dimensions and the three form, as well as the gravitino in 11 dimensions, actually has uh, 1,198 different bosonic fields and 1,186 fermion fields. And you might say, well, wait a minute, Jim, you have not restored the equality. Well, yes, I have, because what I haven't told you is that these fields come in different representations of the Lorentz group. And when you take that into account, exact equality is established between all the bosons and theories and all the fermions and theories. Let me back up a little bit to explain that and make sure this is understood. You'll notice that um, the equality that I talked about here, um, there are, there's a fermion here and one below, and those count as four degrees of freedom each. Whereas in the bosonic sector, you can say, wait a minute, there are, there's one boson that counts as four, but there are also bosons that count as one. And so it's when you start adding in this uh, label, which talks about the irreducible representations in 11 dimensions that you find that our solution actually restores the equality. So this is a result, as I said, 40 year long problem, no one had ever solved it. We solved it not in con any conventional method, but by using notions of polytopes. And that's a whole nother story. I gave a talk at, uh, at the uh, Springs um, 2021 20, uh, presentation this past summer. And at the end of this talk, if anyone interested in that can go and find the link and follow the talk. We wanna move in a different direction. So how were we able to do this? Well, in 2005, I, along with a physicist named Michael Fox, said, you know, if there's a theory like 11 dimensions, maybe it casts a kind of shadow, shadow in lower dimensions where much of the data associated with theory could be associated with the one dimensional theory. And in fact, uh, in this paper that you can see described here, Michael and I introduced a graphical technology for these uh, shadows. We call the shadows of Dinkras. Michael is the person who actually suggested the word. Michael was in uh, the Czech Republic the entire time we worked on this. I was actually first in Africa, then the US, and then back in Africa by the time we finished this work. And the word Adinkra is a word uh, that Michael uh, had uh, learned about a decade earlier that applies to symbols with hidden meaning in the Akan tradition of West Africa. How does the projection work? Well, normally in field theory, you want to, uh, if you're at a fixed point in time, you want to be able to predict the behavior of the fields in the forward light. So what we have done in our construction is say, that's too hard because no one knew how to find all of those field components. So let's ask the question, if you only uh, are interested in the behavior of the field at the same location in space, but at all times in the forward light plane. Then you're essentially doing one dimensional theory, which turns you back into quantum mechanics. And we asked the question of quantum mechanics, and we found to our great uh, uh, pleasure that this unsolved problem was completely solvable. And the solution is, as I said, you simply take four dimensional fields reduced to one dimension. Uh, you keep all the components of four dimensional fields, however. And when you do that, you are led to these graphical figures. These are the things we call adinkras. Uh, that 141 that you see, it's in the middle. The one that was at the top of the superfield, the one at the bottom, uh, at the top and bottom of the scrap, and the fours are here. So that was the hint to us that graph theory might offer a way to understand supersymmetry in a way that had never been done before and allowed some clarity to answer unsolved problems, which we uh, did in uh, 2020. Now, it turns out that these graphs that I showed you, remarkably enough, naturally involve the notion of bits. And the reason is, when we're going to construct them in a few moments, we're going to find that these graphs are all begin their lives, they sort of have a skeleton, you can say, uh, as cubes. And the thing about cubes is the vertices of cubes, if you properly choose your coordinates, 
can always be written as either plus or minus one in a tuple, but plus one is equal minus one to the one to the zero power, and minus one is equal minus one to the uh, first power. And so the vertices of cubes always have bits that you can use to name them. So it's intrinsic in the structure of bits. And here's an example. This is in fact one of our adinkras. In fact, this is the adinkra that was the object behind that 14641 arrangement that you saw. So here you can see 14641. But we've also given bit addresses to the nodes, which are the remnants of the fields that were there in four dimensions. One of our uh, surprising discoveries is that these uh, objects uh, can be manipulated and still preserve the property of supersymmetry. So I'm showing you horizontal motions. This corresponds to taking matrix, thinking about all these entries as uh, components of the vector and applying matrices to them. And so that's how you can change their location horizontally. Now you're seeing a vertical motion. That turns out to be, uh, turns out to be uh, a differentiation because these are actually functions of a single variable, and so you can still differentiate them. And when you do that, that changes their engineering dimension, and therefore it changes how they present in diagrams. So I've just taken you from that 14641, I pulled it apart into two objects that if you look at them, they're remarkably similar. In fact, how similar are they? Well, they could be exactly the same. To show that, I'm gonna change some minus signs to plus signs. I'm going to do a rearrangement, never breaking any of the connections. And now you can see there's perfect matching if I shove the object to the left and right together. Black lines match a lot. Black, blue to blue, dash to dashes, reds to reds, greens to greens. And we can open this back up and we get something that is different from the thing that we started with. And the remarkable thing about the exercise I just took you through is that error correcting codes actually determine how you could do the folding. Although it's not obvious from the cartoon I showed you, this note here is a function. And so when I say that we're folding them up, what we're doing is we're saying this function is numerically equal to the function that sits at the bottom of the adenka. The function that sits here is folded into the function over here. So we see there's some one function associated with this label, a function associated with this, we set them equal to each other. And then the function here gets uh, set equal to the function here. The function here gets set equal to the function here. And the function here gets set equal to the function here. What just happened there? Well, if you look very carefully at the labels, what you can see is that the sum of the bits for the folded labels all add up to the same number, namely 1111. That's an error correcting code, not a quantum error correcting code, but a classical error correcting code. If you had tried to do this identification in any other way, you would have broken supersymmetry. So let's say random, you say, well, I want this function to be equal to that function. Maybe this function equal to the one below. What you do, if you do that and study the property of supersymmetry, you find out supersymmetry gets broken. So error correct, the classical error correcting codes define the irreducible representation of supersymmetry, something that was quite shocking. And when we wrote the paper, when we first tried to present this evidence, it took us uh, something over two years to convince the referee that we were not talking out of our hat, collective hats. So there's the folded object where you see all the error correcting codes uh, uh, demonstrated for the combined nodes. As I said, we uh, made these odd things to In 2010, I actually was asked to write a popular level article for Physics World. And as I said, there will be links at the end. And now it turns out that these crystals, so I showed you the 14641, you can tease them apart so that, uh, so that you see all of their pieces. So this four here actually constitutes the four nodes you see in the middle here. The four here is the four up top, the four here is the four at the bottom. And so you can tease these objects apart and when you do that, what you're actually doing is you're looking at the Z components of the angular momentum of the objects. Uh, those of us who study physics know that there's this quantity called angular momentum. Uh, it, it, has, uh, it, can, uh, it has representations that take on two, two J plus one uh, different functions, the singlet being uh, a single function, the triplet being the J equal one value, the, uh, uh, the five flat being the j equal two value, j equal half uh, is actually four values, j equal three halves is actually 12 and so forth. And so these things, 
uh, can be labeled uh, by Young to Blows, but they ultimately can also be labeled by objects called Beacon labels. And that was part of our magic of being able to solve that 40 year on unsolved problem. Combining the graphs with Dinkin labels leads to the possibility of writing, uh, writing algorithms to, un to solve the problem. Now, you can actually apply this same technology in four dimensions, and what you then find is that this 14641 object that I told you about actually has two different components. You can sort of think of this as a crystal and a diamond cutter has come along and made the perfect cut because these things at the bottom are also uh, supersymmetry representations. And so knowing how to perform this cutting process is the great challenge that I am now chasing now because if I can solve this problem, I will understand all of the irreducible representations of supersymmetry without having to require that dynamical fields are on shell. So how hard is it? Well, I'm going to take you through some of the simplest ways, space, steps in four dimensions. In four dimensions, it turns out that there are lots and lots of what these things we call supermultiples. The, um, the uh, electron, selectron, and the selectron and the electron sit in things that are called chiral multiples. The photon sits in an object called uh, the vector multiple. Uh, there are other multiples. In fact, in four dimensions, there are 10 of these things. And they're related in very interesting ways. The four at the top are actually related to each other by a process we're going to come to shortly. And the four at the bottom are also. Uh, it turns out there's uh, something called duality that also relates uh, different sets of them in different ways. And so one of those 10 can graphically be represented like this. However, that one object can also be subjected to differentiation. And when you do that, you get a different object. And it turns out this contains the same representation as the one that you started with. And so that zoo of things that I was working with actually by what we call the hanging garden theorem. This is something I worked out with uh, other collaborators, including group of mathematicians. We understand that any such graph like this can always be classed in this two height form, an object we call the V. So we've concentrated most of our attention on these things and trying to understand their properties. So this is the differential equation form of the chiral movement. This is its reduced form as a valise. There are three of these basic valises and we want to know uh, it, the question becomes, how does the mathematics, if you look at these graphs, they look incredibly similar. So how does the mathematics know that they're supposed to be distinct objects in the realm of physics? Well, when we do our reduction process, which is what I've described for you here, what you find is that the supersymmetry transformation laws can be recast as a set of differential operators acting on functions of a single variable, and if you look at these functions, you should realize that all of these fives look like they constitute some kind of a vector. All these sides can constitute something in quote that looks like a vector. And when you write these things out clearly, you're going to be led to a set of equations where there are objects that are like vectors that are mixed up by a set of matrices. These matrices turn out to be the adjacent matrices of the graphs that I've shown you. If you know something about graph theory, maybe you've heard about adjacency matrices. But it, we modify them slightly with minus signs, and so that's what the dashing is about. So once one gets this level of understanding of these graph, these matrices and their graphs, then to my mathematical colleagues, it became obvious how we build them in arbitrary dimensions. Namely, start with the hypercube. Here's the tesseract. At alternating vertices of the tesseract, place open and closed nodes. These are the bosons and the fermions. Do this for all of the nodes, following alternating rules. For parallel lines, give them the same color. So this line is parallel to that line, they're both purple. These two lines are uh, parallel, so we give them red. This line and a line that you can't quite see here is parallel. And so we give parallel lines the same color. And then finally, we pick one node and we hang it, that is, we pin it and act like it's a piece of macrame, which is this diagram. And this diagram, you have already seen, you know that is what this is one of these adinkras. And so buried in these adinkras is the fact that it started out as a tesseract, that is a cube in five, five dimensions. But once you know these rules, you can construct lots of these things, and it gets to be quite artistic. 
So let's look more closely at these matrices. It turns out that these matrices belong to a, a mathematical structure called the Cox set of group. In particular, ones that we're looking at have the structure of a set of matrices who squares the identity and have all, it has no non off diagonal entries, but the squares identity. And the rest of the matrix are actually permutations. And so the elements of the Cox set of group, the things that we found from the superintendent transformation laws are a set of sign matrices, time permutations. Here's an explicit example. So here's what we find from the physics. Here we pull out the sign factors and here's the permutation that's left over. And so this can be done for all those super multiplets that I showed you. And in particular, it means that we no longer have to think of the super multiplets in terms of field variables. We can now think of them in terms of permutation elements. Uh, how does it work? Well, this symbol one, two, three, four means take the number one, send it to one, take the number two, send it to two, take number three, send it to three, take number four, send it to four. That's the identity map. Here's another one. Uh, we can take the number one, send it to one, take the number two, send it to three, take the number three, send it to two, send four to four. That is not the identity map, but it's the permutation that's described here. So permutations are very primitive notions, but they contain the essence of the representation of supersymmetry. And so here are the first three of these are the ones that I get from physics. The last three I get from my mathematician's uh, attention and knowing how to build these objects. So how do you get physics out of these things and not even knowing anything out of the fields? Well, it turns out the mathematicians are very clever as many of us know who work with mathematicians. And this object that I'm showing you here is again that 14641, but this time it's arranged by something very, very different. This is something called, the mathematicians call weak blue hat ordering. Namely, there is a way to use mathematics to put a distance function on the space of permutations. And when you do that, you find out that the permutations labeled by these quartets of numbers with the identity permutation being at the very bottom of this diagram, what you find is using this mathematical notion a weak blue hat ordering. There's something else called, called Kindle Tau ordering. And for people who know something about computer science, this is called bubble sorting. All of these are the same thing in our context. But if you use these, you find out that the permutations have a distance between that's defined by this intrinsic mathematical property. And once you know about that, that drives us back to the crystal that we saw in the Fodger sites. The crystal for the phlogiocyte has 24 different vertices. There are 24 different permutations in this image. And so you can say, is it possible for me to keep the linking information that the mathematicians give us, but set the vertices, uh, set the permutations at the vertices of this crystal? And the answer turns out to be yes. This is in fact an object that the mathematicians study called the permutahedron. And so we are well deep into the mathematics. It's well-established mathematics. We haven't broken any rules, but where does the physics come from? Well, remember the chiral multiple? It turns out that the chiral multiple was four permutation, but they are associated with this set of vertices that you see blink, blinking in this diagram. The so-called tensor multiple, the thing that has the two form in it, is associated with the nodes that are blinking in this diagram. The vector multiplet is associated with the permutations shown in this diagram. So what we learn is that supersymmetry is really a property of the permutation group, but exactly what property is it? So I'm going to answer that question for the simplest case. Which, ah, those other three supermultiplets that the mathematicians taught them how to do are also arrayed around so we now have a visual way. I mean, if I gave you those diagrams with the flash, you would say, gee, you're associating these things with each other. And the way that you associate them is actually very, very uniform. How do we quantify that? Well, the idea is that we can calculate what we call correlators. Let me explain a correlator. Um, if I take this node that my cursor is circling around here, I can ask myself using this metric that the mathematicians uh, teach me, how far is this node from this mode? node? Well, the answer is one leap. 
How far is it from this node? The minimal distance is two meters. How far is it from this node? Again, the minimal distance is two meters. What about this one? The distance is three meters. So this is what we mean by correlators, namely using the metric that's applied by the mathematicians with the notion of Kendall tau, the Kendall tau function, or weak, uh, or the weak blue hat ordering. What are the distances between sets of nodes, pairs of nodes? And so this is a set of calculations that we've done on that entire object. And what we find, what this notation means is take an object from one of the sets. There are four sets. So this label capital A runs from one to four. And then each four, in each four set, there are four permutations. So the small label stands for which of those permutations. So calculate the distances between these. We're first going to do this calculation where the set A and B are different. And you find out that the distances uh, this distances, it gives you a matrix, which I'm going to introduce later, but that matrix allows you to calculate its trace and its eigenvalues. And that's what you see listed here. So you can see that, uh, in general, things spread themselves out. What about those special quartets? Well, the special quartets are truly special. If you calculate these correlator uh, uh, matrices, as we call them, what you find is that for each of the quartets, only the numbers 4, 6, and 2 appear uh, in the, uh, these uh, correlated matrices. And since the distance between an object and itself is always zero, the diagonal entries are always zero. You can calculate the eigenvalues associated with these, and we'll come to those shortly. So this is uh, uh, the uh, calculation on those flashing objects. And every single one of the flashing objects only has the numbers 2, 6, and 4 appearing in their correlator function. We also noted that this is a little bit like the game of Sudoku, because if you add the sums of all the row of the columns, you'll find out every column sums to 12. Also, every row sums to 12. And not only is this true in those special sets, this is true actually for all uh, quartets, no matter whether the elements are in um, one of these special quartets where you have the flashing or not. And so, there are rules of the, on these two-point correlator matrices that determine the supersymmetry representation. And as I said, uh, the eigenvalues of anything within the same set, here you recalculate them. So these notion of two-point correlators uh, are, are where we can see the polytopic symmetries that control the representations of supersymmetry. So what's next? Well, there are a couple of ways that you can generalize it. You can look at uh, more uh, more complicated supersymmetries, what in the language of field theory is called 40 into 2 Susie, which, which leads to an object with 40,320 nodes and 120, 141, 120 edges. This object is also known to our mathematician colleagues. It's called the hexi penti truncated seven simplex. And so I and some of my students are busy studying this object, applying the notion of the metric that comes from Kendall Tau, as well as uh, Weak Bluehead. They both need the same uh, answer. And seeing if, again, we can get two-point correlated functions that when you are in these super multiplets, you can identify common sets of traces and um, eigenvalues. Here's, a pic, uh, here's some more data about the about, uh, the, it's also called the omni truncated simplex, or simply. It has some faces that are hexagons, some faces that are pentagons, and some faces that are squares. If we look back in my discussion, you'll notice in the case of n equal one, there are square faces, there are six square faces, and there are six, hex, uh, eight hexagon, hexagonal faces. And so one of the things that we're going to tackle is in the omni, in the omni uh, simplex, how many six faces are there? How many five faces? How many four faces? And we are looking for ways to do this, obviously, by computer. Now, this might seem like a, a fool's errand, but I remind you that uh, in solving the problem of finding the embedding of 11 dimensional supergravity into one of these graphs, uh, we faced a problem with 4.2 billion unknowns and we solved it. Uh, this is not yet at that order. And so we're confident that with a lot of hard work, we're going to be able to 
reach the same sort of conclusions here. And for the first time, develop a polytopic uh, basis for understanding supersymmetry. So I want to end by talking a little bit about my teaching activities. Uh, my research, as I said, is usually done with other physicists like Michael Fox that got us started. But our latest efforts where we've been looking at these two-point correlators, I've actually been doing with one of my graduate students, Alexander Tianchara, uh, one of my, uh, other my graduate students, uh, John Gray Hugh, and an undergraduate student, Renee Kerr. I've also done uh, some of this work with Devin Bristow, uh, John Caporoletti, uh, Delina Levine, and Gabe Jorger. And so not only have we been able to offer a totally new perspective on what are the symmetries that are at work in supersymmetry, we've also used this as a way to allow young people very early in their career to, to actually be part of the discovery of things that no one in the world knew before we get our research done. And so this is something I've actually been doing for about 20 years in a very small summer program. Uh, here are the links about the research papers. Uh, and then uh, if you want to get sort of more information about Adinkras, the links are here. So at this point, I'm done. Thank you so much, Jim. I can speak for everyone when I say that we just always enjoy your talks and thank you so much. Um, so we're just going to jump quickly into a few questions. Feel free to put your questions in the Q&A chat if you have any, um, and then we'll read them aloud for you um, so that Jim can answer them. Right, so I was gonna, uh handle reading the questions. Um, and the first one that we have from uh, an anonymous person in the chat is oftentimes observations are a means to determine the validity, the validity of a theory. Do you think that as we strive to have a deeper understanding of the natural world using quantum mechanics, observations uh, become less important? <laughs> not, not I. Um, at the beginning of the talk, uh, uh, when I, David and I were just in conversation, uh, we were talking about the, when I first met him. I was doing weak interaction phenomenology uh, when I started my career in physics. I didn't start out in supersymmetry, which is something people are really shocked to hear because they think somehow I've only thought about formal mathematics uh, in my entire career. My first two publications are phenomenological. We were looking at things like allowed regions for what is called CB and CA uh, back when uh, people were worried about four fermion uh, phenomenological Lagrangians and how that describes weak interaction. So I tell people that um, for me, the only thing that keeps physics from becoming a faith-based activity is the fact that nature and observation and experiment ground us. Otherwise, we would be just like any other debating society where there is no firm uh, foundation to establish the validity or the falsity of our beliefs. So no, I'll never. When if that were to ever happen, I don't think it would be physics anymore. All right, and uh, a second question, which might be a quick one, is what's the summer program? <laughs> I was afraid someone was going to ask that question, so there are um, slides that I didn't use where uh, I can do some talking about that. So give me a second to switch. And I'll, I'll share screen. So I'm going to talk about the program, first of all, by pointing out someone who was actually in the audience. Uh, this is a student named uh, Devin Visto. He was in our 2020 program as, as well. Some students don't get enough of the kind of torture that we subject them to, so they want to come back for more. So Devin is one of the students that came back for a second year. And he, in fact, is one of the people who's looking at this seven-color omni simplex with me. Uh, the first speaker in the series is the young lady on the right-hand side of this image. Uh, some of you happen to know that is my daughter. 
Uh, she is actually a, uh, an alum like Devin of our summer program. And Ibrahim Ba, who is a string theorist at um, Johns Hopkins University, uh, was also an alum. You can actually see him in 2005, 16 years ago, looking much like himself unchanged. Uh, we that summer met out at the University of Iowa with my colleague, uh, Vincent Rogers. And then uh, 2016 pictures uh, back at the University of Maryland, you can see me here, my hair starting to go white and short, folks, and Vincent is standing over here. So in 1999, this young woman who was then an undergraduate at Harvard joined Vincent and me uh, during the summer. Uh, in those days, Vince and I were close collaborators, and we normally do our collaborative work in the summer. But that summer, he brought two students with him, a graduate student and this undergraduate student. She was an undergraduate at Harvard. Her name is Karina Curto. And so I was puzzled as to why she was there. And Vince basically said, watch. And sure enough, this was the first undergraduate I had ever written a paper with on theoretical physics. Uh, Karina is currently a, neuro by, a, a neurophysicist, I would call her, because she studies the operation of the brain. But as this article, as she stated in this article, she has certain advantages because she thinks like a physicist. Uh, she was featured uh, in a story uh, in 2018 in Quanta Magazine. The link is at the bottom for anyone who uh, wishes to follow it. So I've been doing this off and on, essentially, for every summer for 20 years. Maybe I missed a summer or two, but this is why I can tell people for 50 consecutive years, I have been teaching college students. Because uh, if I didn't, even when I was on sabbatical, I was doing this. Uh, anyone who wants to know about the summer program, there's a set of links. Uh, I can provide these to anyone who will uh, send me uh, an email message. And I'm sure the organizers can provide any such interested party. Um, and there's an article actually coming out in um, in the, the in the physics newsletter in about two months, where we talk about in greater detail than any of these articles what goes on. This last link, by the way, is the link that describes the program in ultimate detail. It's also the way that students get to apply to our program, but we don't take applications until. Uh, starting in February. What do we do in the program? We teach undergraduates to think like physicists. And we do it by the process of making them become co-authors in a torturous manner, uh, in a manner that is consistent with the statement that Richard Feynman said that you, let me see if I can find the statement. Richard Feynman made this wonderful statement that if you are passionate about learning something, find the most unorganized, uh, troubling and uh, another adjective method for doing it. That's what our program instans instantiates. That's how we do our program. And we were doing this long before I knew about Richard Feynman's quote. Right, and our final question I think is, uh, how does one go about in constructing a metric for the space or group of permutations? Ah, okay, so the way that it works is the I mean, is the following. Um, it turns out that, let me go back to the Bermuda Hebrew. That, that's the simplest way for me to explain. It. I'm also, of course, fascinated by the fact that the Bermuda Hebrew shows up in other places. It was recently noted by my graduate student, uh, Alex, that uh, if you look in the, look in the foundational discussions on the associate Hebrew, the Bermuda Hedron is there too. Okay, so um, let, so here's the Bermuda Hedron. So how does it work? Okay, so the permutations are the nodes that you see around the faces, uh, the, uh, at the vertices. And I think you need I, to, I, I you need oh, to share your screen Thank again. You. Okay, I'm sorry, I have to do share. Thank you, give me a second. Okay, I hope everyone can see the Bermuda Hedron now. Great. Okay, so you, if you look at the labels on the vertices, you'll see that they're quartets of numbers. These are the names of those permutations I was telling you about. And now the links are also permutations, folks. So permutation matrices play the role of links. 
and permutation rows also play the roles of the vertices. And so uh, when you see uh, an image like this, what's really going on is we're taking this link and multiplying by a permutation. Now, it turns out that in the permutation of all the permutations, there's one subset of what are called two cycles. A two cycle, um, let's see, actually, actually I showed a two, ah, a two cycle, this object is a two cycle. It's a permutation where you take one to one, four to four, but you interchange two and three. So only two digits were changed for there. So those are called two cycles in the language of mathematics of permutation. So if we look at the entire permutation group uh, over uh, uh, for four elements, uh, there are three of these two cycles. And so if you uh, go to the permutation, you'll notice there are only three colors of links here. That's because one of these is one of those two cycles. The other color is the third is the second two cycle, and the third color corresponds to the third of those two cycles. So you take the identity element and you multiply it by these three basic two cycles. That will get you to this vertex, this vertex, and this vertex. Now you repeat this process for these derived vertices. So you take this and multiply by all the two cycles. Take uh, this one multiplied by two cycles. Take um, that one and multiply by two cycles. Now sometimes that will bring you back to where you started from, but when it doesn't, it pushes you to other vertices. And so repeating this process over and over and over again, you will fill out every single permutation in the permutation group, and they will be connected by some number of links. And so this is what induces this metric on the space of permutations that we then calculate uh, two-point functions in terms of this metric. Thank you. And I think we have uh, one last question, if we can briefly, uh, which is, could you give some advice to undergrads wanting to get into theory, any courses we should take early on? Um, so look, I'm a, I, I double majored as an undergraduate. And so that meant that, uh, in fact, my first degree is actually in mathematics and my second bachelor's degree is actually in physics. And so all I can tell you, I, well, first of all, I don't give advice. I can only tell you what I know about works and the guinea pig in this case is me. Uh, I took as many courses in both mathematics and physics that I could handle at MIT. And that's how I wound up getting two degrees. Uh, you definitely need to finish off the basic calculus courses as quickly as possible and get to differential equations because differential equations, well, that's what Isaac Newton actually invented, folks. And from that invention comes physics. So you're, in some sense, you're not really doing physics unless you're dealing with differential equations. So you got to get to those as quickly as possible. It also helps, once you've gotten that under your belt, to start to study linear algebra. That's where you're going to get these matrices that we saw in SG3, and ultimately the kind of matrices that open the door for me discovering the relationships for how to solve this 40-year-old unsolved problem in supergravity, because I know how to do with matrices. Uh, number theory is a good thing. String, teach, string theory teaches us differential geometry and topology because differential geometry is the basis for general relativity and supergravity does have gravity in it. So knowing something about differential geometry is a, a great investment. And then topology, both for studying these weird little graphs because they're actually topological objects. I didn't say that, but they're actually topological objects. They're not geometric objects. And if you're studying string theory, as David well knows, topology is how you calculate the quantum corrections of string theory. So all of these things for people, if you're thinking about following a path that's similar to mine, these are things you need to get to, learn as well as possible, and uh, they will open the doorway. Let me say one other thing about my summer program. Uh, our summer program is like a camp for people who want to become Olympians. Uh, it's not easy, folks. It's very hard. And uh, that's the only way I know to get you to what it is that we do. It's great fun uh, to do. As I, as I said, Devin is actually on this, uh, this, this um, presentation. I saw his name in the chat. And he's, the, one of, he's one of our latest victims, I like to call him. And so he can tell you what really goes on, how terribly painful it is 
because it's not like any class you've ever taken. And it's not like any summer program I know about either. It's unique. All right, thanks so much. Those were uh, all of our questions, I think. Um, thanks so much, Jim. Thanks so much, uh, everyone else on the panel and KITP. Um, Farah, did you want to say anything closing it out? No, thank you, everyone. <laughs> okay, and thank you for listening. I'm leaving now. Bye-bye. <laughs>